Hello and welcome to Season 1 of Digital Marketing Masterclass, Ferratech's podcast dedicated to collecting insights of the marketing world's leading thought leaders to teach you the ideal systems for generating leads, nurturing leads into clients, and then converting those clients into raving fans of your company, brand, and vision. Today's guest is Andy Crestadina. Andy is the founder and chief marketing officer of Orbit Media, an award-winning Chicago-based web design company. Over the past 20 years, he has provided digital strategy to more than a thousand businesses. Recognized nationally as a top-rated speaker, he's also co-founder of Content Jam, Chicago's largest content marketing conference. Authoring hundreds of articles on digital marketing, he has been featured in critically acclaimed media outlets including Forbes, Inc. Magazine, and Mashable. He's also the author of Content Chemistry, the illustrated handbook for content marketing. And I can say without exaggerating, his blog is the number one blog that I read on a regular basis. So please, internet, put your hands together for Andy Crestadina. Andy, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Chris. This will be great. Yeah, we're excited. We're excited. We were talking before the show and... uh, it's kind of amazing how many similarities we sort of have between our, mm-hmm. you know, our companies. And I do believe, and I, I tell people this all the time, that what I love about being in the marketing industry, and I think, I think it was like Ryan Dice that talked about, he did some statistic about how much actual work there is out there for marketing companies, meaning so many companies need to represent their company and their brand, and there's so much work that marketing companies, we actually, it's kind of funny because... Why you think we would be competitive, it's actually kind of really fun to just make friends in your own industry, in your own space. And so, like, people ask me, who's my competition? I'm like, actually, nobody. I mean, somebody, but nobody in the aspect of it's it's it's, it's I awesome. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you think you're competing with someone, if you sit down with them for half an hour, you'll figure out, like, they've got a different target audience or a different <laughs> price point or they, yeah. you know, you've, you know, you're turning down clients they'd like or vice versa. And there's basically, you know... Friends and um, you know people who you will be friends with. Those are yeah. the two kinds of people. Yeah, I mean, I, I like learn from I learn from competitors. I learn from sure people. I be, yeah, it's it's been wonderful. It's wonderful. So yeah. I became a fan of you before I even got introduced to you. Uh, so before the idea or the concept of content clusters or families of content came out, I believe Andy was kind of like the pioneer of really simplifying how to really mm. marry content in a way that's useful to be you know to be understood and, and scraped by Google, but also in a way that we consume content. Just it's it's an amazing thing when you think about how content really is when you take a couple steps back. So much of it is just what it feels like common sense. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one true. of your gifts, Andy, is making things that look complex <laughs> look incredibly simple. <laughs> Because I brought your approach to our team and my guys are like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, we, we can do that, whatever it is. It took <laughs> us six months <laughs> to change all of our SOPs to do it. Mm. I was like, if, it, if, if that was so easy, <laughs> like, why didn't you do it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've gotten that before. That's high praise. Thank you for that. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it, it's a challenge. It's mm-hmm. the job is to boil it down and not use jargon and – you know, explain things in simple terms. Yeah. It's like, uh, it, you know, it's a form of accessibility. Yeah. Some people, they write stuff and it's just like a little bit too hard to understand. And it's very common on websites, of course, as you and I know, there's people who, who write home pages and, you know, headers that just don't make sense to anybody and they're kind of meaningless or tagline stuff. So, yeah, I think um, I'm always working on that. I do a lot of going back now and updating old articles and I'm seeing just how uh, even the language on some of those like could have been much simpler. Like, I could, why did I have these extra words in this sentence? So it's part editing, but definitely uh, just experience of having had one million meetings and seeing people's faces <laughs> as I try to explain something, as you know very well. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was. I, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I don't know how to describe it, but just people that communicate very effectively. But the the, the authors that I like usually talk in succinct sentences and they don't, Mm -hmm. they don't ramble on and on. And, and, you know, one of the ones that Steve Jobs said is simple is hard. Mm -hmm. And as I read our, you know, our blog writers and our content writers and stuff like that, I'm like, I'm constantly like, this is cool. How do you make it like this? (laughs) Right. Without losing the meaning. You know what I mean? It's just a battle, you know? 
While I'm writing, which I was doing this morning, I'm sort of all remembering just how close the back button is to every word I write. Yeah. <laughs> just always remember that. We all need like a little bit of that requisite fear, you know, that that person is just going to quit paying attention, yeah. that we got boring, that we made it overly complicated, uh, that we missed an opportunity to add formatting. Like if I'm writing a paragraph and there's three ideas in it, that needs to be a bullet list. Yeah. You know, if I'm describing something and, you know, I'm, I'm seeing arrows and boxes in my mind, that needs to be a diagram. So I'm always looking for ways to add formatting, shorten sentences, shorten paragraphs, use fewer words, add visuals. I have almost a standard now, I don't talk about it much, but I try to make sure that there's something of visual interest at every scroll depth on every yeah. article. That's awesome. It used to be like, put in a good picture. No, no, no. Put in a good picture all like at every scroll depth. There should never be a point at which there's not something of visual interest in the viewport for that reader, mobile or desktop. So yeah. yeah, these are um, these are the challenges, but uh, it's competitive. It's tough, you know. And these, this is exactly how um, we need to be differentiating. Yeah, and that is why you have the illustrated handbook. <laughs> That's right. <of> content chemistry. <laughs> yeah, very, That's the key very, word. very cool. Yeah, yeah. I um, I love that book. By the way, it's. Mm. A, I think it's. I think it's amazing how you know, you're taking a lot of the, the same things that almost everyone's kind of preaching about. But what you're doing is, is that I really liked how a lot of the stuff that you're doing is very digestible. Just even everything from how you index it, why you use the book, when to use the book. You can read this book from left to right, but I also feel that it's also like a handbook as well. Like meaning like you don't have to have read every single chapter. You can go and pick certain pieces that you, that you like, which I, which I enjoy. Yeah. I get that feedback a lot. People say, you know, I've, um, you know, I had an earlier edition. I keep it on my desk, and they they send me pictures of like this dog-eared, kind of ripped up thing with post-it notes in it. And <laughs> that that's also high praise. I mean, that that's a good sign because it's not it's not a novel. There's no plot. Yeah. You don't have to <laughs> read the whole thing. Like it's yeah. open the table of contents. Like oh, for example, like I'm having my email metrics stink. Right, no one's opening or clicking through. Like how can I maximize my email open rates and click through rates? Mm. Oh. That's the page. Open it up. Oh, make sure the sender name is a human name, not a brand name. Oh, 20% lift in open rates. Yeah. Yeah. Five minutes, no cost. Like you didn't, ha you didn't have to read the first, there's probably a hundred pages before that page. You can read them all if you want, but it's also just kind of a, a desk reference sort of content guide. Yeah. So one of the things I enjoy about it is I think it's just because I'm old <laughs> is that I like having a book in my hand. Like in other words, all of this stuff you could have put in a blog. I read your blogs. I watch a lot of your videos. But it's something about maybe it's just my age and I just love having a highlighter and a page to turn. And it's just something about the way, you know, I went to school for, you know, 25 mm -hmm. years without the internet. I remember the day mm -hmm. when my buddy says I can send you an email and I just didn't get it. <laughs> like what that could possibly be. <laughs> They have the internet on computers now. I wish that it translated better into other formats. You and I talked briefly about audiobooks. It doesn't really work at all. It's the illustrated handbook. Yeah. And the ebook version not get, doesn't get great reviews. I mean, there's things in there that just uh, very hard on a little, you know, on a, on a Kindle or something. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a total tree hugger, conservation minded, like reduce, reduce, you know, recycle guy. But. Uh, I got to recommend this one in print. It's just, it's sort of meant for that. It works far, far better in that format. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So you put on an event every year, well, before COVID called Content Jam. Mm -hmm. What is that? Unpack that. Sure. Um, well, if you go way back, I remember the early days. So you and I both founded these businesses in the same year within a few months of each other. Yeah. Like these are like, yeah. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, I need to know a lot more people so that I'm there when someone who has this service need, web design, which, you know, people do like once every four years or something, you know, so my network's big enough so that I'll be able to pay the bills, started going to networking events, and then realized in uh, probably 2010 that uh, if I spoke at an event, that I would get a much better networking benefit, having demonstrated expertise, which is kind of what you're doing, you know, when networking, partly, uh, to a much bigger group. So I went from going to networking events to actually giving presentations whenever possible, even to classrooms, like any anywhere that would take me. And then evolved that into like a, hey, I could just start my own networking events. 
and started a monthly event called Wine and Web. We had a conf- you know, our conference room here, open the door, people come. So started doing that, still do that. This is year 11 for, for Wine and Web. Wow. And then realized, like, after going to all these conferences, I know I've, I've seen 10 million sessions. I know some of the best speakers in the business. I'm sort of friendly with these people. There isn't another one here in Chicago. Why don't I just start a little content marketing event, and we'll just get some people to come present. In the very first year, actually, it was just like me and some other partners, and we kind of did it really sort of scrappy format. But it grew until, I think, um, 2019, it got to like 700 people. That's um, great. Yeah. Like uh, one day, single track um, breakout, a hybrid. So you do like keynote, keynote, breakout, lunch, breakout, keynote, 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 party. <laughs> and it was fun and, and people loved it and the feedback was great and people still write to me like when's the next content jam people still pitch us can we present a content jam so it's just an extreme example it's basically if you start networking and get, get very active with content and if you like to teach and if you're good at networking and you go to conferences anyway you know like follow that line out mm-hmm. you're gonna you're gonna run a conference yeah that's so, very cool very cool and so how many years has that been on did you say uh, there were eight, I think. There were eight? That, um, yeah, we did it a bunch of times. Yeah. I'm not wearing one of the shirts now. That's one of the sad things. I mean, unless COVID ends eventually, I'm going to run out of clothes. I need <laughs> these events to like, I won't have the t-shirts anymore. Uh, I'm in Philadelphia. You're in Chicago. And I heard on one of your videos and it's very similar to, to my story. I think you showed like a tax return about oh, yeah. how much money you made in like year one and two. Mm-hmm. And yeah, my, ugly. I, yeah. I, I tell, I tell it in a way that I'm like. I actually doubled my revenue every year for the first three years. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> from zero? <laughs> exactly. From like yeah. one bag of ramen noodles to two bags of ramen noodles to three bags of ramen noodles. Same. Yeah. Same Z's, man. Totally. It, it yep. was uh, – I was an IT recruiter in the late 90s and did very well because it was Y2K and the tech bubble was inflating and everyone needed programmers for stuff. Yep. And, and, and my girlfriend thought I was nuts. Like, what mm-hmm. are you doing? You're quitting a job? Web design? There's already web design companies. Yeah. You're too, it's already 2001 and you're too late to start a web design company. So don't listen to people who, I mean, there's plenty of white space for all kinds of service providers. This, the economy is massive and, and you, know, you don't need that many to stay alive in the very beginning. But mm-hmm. no, I went from like 50 grand a year to like five grand mm-hmm. to 15. You know, it was four years before I replaced my income prior to that. Yeah. That's not a marketing story. That's just a story of entrepreneurship, which a lot of people are very familiar with. Yep. I had to make seventeen hundred dollars a month to pay for me and my assistant to live, mm. mm-hmm. and everything above that was gravy. <laughs> and that was the first three years. Like I, well, my friends got married, I worked. My friends bought houses, I worked. My friends had kids, I worked. Twenty years later, they're like, "Oh my gosh, you're like an overnight success story." <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Twenty years in one night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. They're like, you know what? I should start a business too. I was like, should you? <laughs> mm, yeah, you kind of got the mortgage now. I don't know. I know. You, you can you're never too late, but uh, very yeah. different game. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it is crazy how kind of all that stuff works out. And I'm I'm as uh, like kind of like a as much as I love marketing and I read up about marketing, my other passion is kind of the entrepreneurial side mm-hmm. as well. And so that's you know. If I'm reading something, it's one of those two. It's out of one of those two. two well, guests. it segues back because uh, the the scrappy, hungry entrepreneurs don't have budgets for advertising. Yeah. How are you going to keep in touch with people? You came back from that event with with a couple of business cards. How are you going to put those people on some kind of you know program where you're, they're going to be you know you'll be visible to them over time? Mm-hmm. We all started doing content marketing because we were broke, or at I least know. for me, right? I, no, I, how else? What am I going to do? It's like I need an organic, low-cost, low-risk way to do that. Oh, it's going to take a couple of years? That's fine. I'm, I'm starting now. Yeah. So, yeah, that's um, you, content you, marketing. Were, is were like, you married when you started the business? Uh, I got married shortly after with a marriage that didn't take. That okay. was, um, and I don't know if that was maybe a factor. I think that. You know, she yeah. liked the, you know, how well I was doing in the earlier days. It, I don't think that was a reason, but <laughs> no, I, would, I, I had, uh, I had almost no expense. I had a cat, yep. um, <laughs> I had a sec, you know, a second bedroom. Um, I had a, like an old Nokia brick cell phone. 
Expenses nope. were lo- were so low. So low. And, so low. And, and now, Chris, that's a problem for us in a way, right? Because the barrier to entry to start companies like ours is zero. <laughs> so anybody, you know. Yep. You know, it, it, it pushes down prices and creates, yep. uh, you know, um, but it's all good. It's good. We, I, I love this system we all work within. And, um, yeah. uh, you know, there's, like I said, you don't need, I mean, the services we offer are almost in universal demand. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you don't need millions of clients to make a healthy living. Yeah, you don't. You don't. And how many team members do you have now? 44. Wow. Full time. Yeah. It's up. It's up from 40 uh, this last six months. Um, we're just seeing a little bubble and um, staying on top of it and everything, yeah. you know, we're very carefully managing uh, capacity and utilization um, yeah. and the pipeline. So, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of people when you add up, you know, covering healthcare, how many of them have families, like I know. pressure, right? <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that's, hard. that's, that's the thing that like, mm-hmm. You know, you do have to know that, you know what, like for every person that works for you, you probably have three depend. They probably might have three dependents no, if they're, if they're sure. married. And it's just yep. it's the response. You, I noticed it at Christmas parties. We bring our team out for Christmas parties. Or I know, you know what I mean? They bring mm-hmm. the whole family <laughs> and it's expensive. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you're like, you're like, wow, I didn't realize how big this thing was until yeah. you have these aha moments where you're like, oh my goodness. Yeah. And our clients rely on us. A lot of people, right? If you're doing it right, yeah. you end up becoming, I mean, the, the pressure builds gradually, but you end, up, you end up becoming someone that people depend on. Mm-hmm. A lot of people need us to work hard and do a good job every day. Yeah. I had three clients come to my wedding that weren't invited. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's pretty great. Cool. Yeah, that's it's great. Cool. I mean, like, that's, that's kind of like the call sign of, like, you know what? Like, I'm only going to live on this planet maybe... I, you know, 50 to 70 mm-hmm. years, maybe 80 years, you know, like if I'm going to trade time for money, like at least I'm working or I'm in the trenches with people that I love. You know what I mean? And that's, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah, man. I think we just had a moment here. <laughs> so now let's talk about something in your book you wrote. It says the most useful website wins. I might mm. have butchered that, but in other words, again, I always quote you as the guy who oversimplified and not over that simplifies things that people might overlook. Mm. Literally, that is the quest here, right? And why is yeah. that so hard? Right. It's um, one way that I put it, and this might not be the same thing that you were thinking of, but content marketing is like a, a, a contest of generosity. It's like the Olympics of generosity. So whoever is the best at getting helpful, useful information, like your SOPs or like a hundred of us, you know, just whatever mm-hmm. we happen to know, out of our brains and onto the into a browser, <laughs> into our content management systems, into blog posts, into videos, uh, into search results, into inboxes, into social streams, uh, that company, that brand, that person will win the most love and attention and trust and um, from the most people. It's a contest of generosity. So whoever is, whoever successfully gives away the best advice gets back the most audience and awareness and trust and, and, um, and, and, you know, subscribers and followers and, and ultimately leads. So, uh, this is year, uh, 14 for me. Um, I started publishing content in 2007. And so, uh, in that time I've written, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of words, 500 articles, you know, 60 videos, hundreds and hundreds of webinars, all those events. And what's the outcome? A million and a half visitors a year, 15,000 subscribers, 100 plus thousand followers across all channels, and 900 leads per year, marketing qualified leads per year. Wow. That is way more than I need. I own, we only do 50 projects a year. So do the math. We're like rejecting most leads, just being picky, choosing ones only that are a strong fit, wow. people that are like financially qualified and respect our process and don't push us with timelines. And, you know, it just has to make sense. The whole thing has to make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yep, that is an outcome of having uh, been working hard at turning, at, you know, the flywheel and momentum and just publishing the book, the events, the blog posts, the videos, the conferences, all those ecosystem, right? Thinking of content. So, yeah, that's how I think of it. Um, that's what we're doing. Uh, the people that are the best at this are, don't hold back. They're trying to win a contest of generosity. That's cool. That's really cool. Now, you know, we do something. We, you know, I put a name on everything. We call it quasi, which is questions with answers and simple information. I and love that. 
Yeah. And I think you, you know, I've, I've heard you talk about this issue, uh, this, this, uh, a lot And the a- aspect is, is that sometimes people just want a quick answer, mm-hmm. but the, the companies that understand the questions that are asked before they're answered mm-hmm. and have a short answer and an in-depth answer to give them more than they asked for. Mm. I find that those are the companies that when they make that commitment, Every single time, their thought leadership, their influence, all of it just continues to, you know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. It's, I think it depends on the category. So you and I work in a world where there are expert writers and content promoters and people who really understand SEO and social media and, promo- and you know, all, the, all the things that go together to make content successful. So in our space, it's very, very competitive. I think though when we work with clients, sometimes you realize like, wow, this you know these people are in like sleepy little industry. You don't yeah. need to be an Olympian <laughs> content marketer to win. So yeah. it is contextual. It depends on the category you're in. That quasi thinking, I love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I think about with that lately though is this trend in Google where they put so many different features into search results pages. Yeah. If you search for something, you're going to see a featured snippet. People also ask a box. You're going to see a knowledge bo- a knowledge panel. You know, all these things that the search results are now so rich that uh, SEO strategies that, that um, rely on getting traffic or visibility from short answers, not, not building on sand. I know that you and I kind of share this idea about like, you know, that sort yeah. of rented land. Like it's not a secure position to be in. Mm-hmm. But you make it more secure by doing exactly what you just said, Chris, by going deeper into these topics, by being unexpectedly helpful, unexpectedly direct and simplified language, uh, unexpectedly visual, unexpectedly well supported with evidence and research from other things, unexpectedly collaborative by getting other people's voices into the, into the content, right? Sources, uh, citing sources and getting contributor quotes and influencer marketing. So yeah, I think it's um, uh, definitely, uh, definitely the trick, right? And that's when you get comments. That's what mo- comments mostly are now, right? And feedback and yeah. social, like, wow, this was, you know, this was way more than I expected. Wow, this content is free. Wow, this wasn't even gated. Wow, this is this is you know your typical article is better than their ultimate guide. That's what you're trying to get. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's kind of for for those who are listening. A lot of the people that listen to my show, I have a very SEO tilt to what we do. I do too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm an SEO. <laughs> I know, I know. We talked about this before uh, when we were, we were we were pregame before the show, and I was talking about how I was this close to just call, calling our services content marketing, and I kept running into sales roadblocks where people are like, "Content? I can write content." I'm like, mm-hmm. no, you can. <laughs> if you could, you would. You know what I mean? And so, when you talk a lot about content marketing, so much of what Andy talks, what Andy does, is just how you optimize, how you marry content together, how you go after backlinks. There's so much science behind the mm-hmm. words on the page. But at the same time, you can't overcomplicate it. Like in other words, what I what I don't want you to feel when you hear from a content marketer or from an SEO person is that I'm going to go in this long rant about schema and robot TXT and all of this like stuff. Oh, <laughs> you know not I mean? that again. I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? As if that's a factor. Like, come on, yeah. people. Yeah. It's not going to make the difference. It, it's not. But what I would like you to unpack, and this is something I, I you know, I, I gleaned from your videos and it, it hurt my soul because I never put data behind it, is that maybe three to 5% of content on the entire web is link worthy. Mm-hmm. So if you need to rank and you need backlinks, you've done extensive studying and found out that, you know what, everyone's trying to yeah. jump into the content game, but 97% of people are failing. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's, there is a very specific reason why any web page ranks or doesn't rank for a given phrase. Now, if it's, uh, those reasons vary. It's not the same across categories. It's not the same across content. It's not the same across different audiences or keyword intent. So if you take if you take a page, so people will say, you know, can you help me with this page or this phrase or can you look at this? And I'm taking a look at this, and you have to understand that before you can make any recommendations. For some people, you know, authority and relevance, their problem is authority. 
They don't have enough links. They're targeting phrases for which they'll never have a chance. And there is no point in going down the path of, you know, keyword research or, you know, yeah. technical SEO. It, nothing matters yet. They're a brand new website with super low authority. Work on that first. That's going to mean creating some link-worthy content. We can get into link building in a second. Other pages, if you people say like, oh, how come I don't rank for this key phrase? Okay, well, let's talk about it. Let's, you know, does your site have sufficient authority? Three seconds later, yes, you do. Show me which page, you know, what is the best page on, on your site for that topic? Oh, you don't really have a page about that topic. <laughs> you haven't yeah. made a great, but you, your problem is relevance. You need completely different medicine. Prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. So all you have to do is to look at someone's key phrase and URL. And by the way, it's not about websites. It's about pages. Yeah. Google does not rank websites. Google has never ranked a website. Google only ranks web pages. Some people somehow miss that. Like they forget that you have to have a page about each thing. Yeah. Once you understand that and once you look at it, you can quickly diagnose and then it comes down to one of those two factors. Almost always. It's almost never the, the technical SEO problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost never the user interaction signals problem. It's almost always an issue of either a lack of sufficient authority or a lack of um, strong relevance on the key phrase slash topic. So how does it go from building links to the actual services pages, which you wish would rank. Mm -hmm. It's extremely hard to get links on services pages. How, it does is. It get, how does it get there? Well, I mean, I know so the answer, the, but I want to hear you say it because no, I, you say it so much better than I do. I might have a different answer. It's, so it's possible for the service page to rank even without links to it directly, depending on how competitive the key phrase is. One way to think about it is like every key phrase is a different competition. Every page is a different competitor. That's just 101. Start there. So do you have a chance of, so does, is that a good competitor in that competition? One of the factors is does it have sufficient authority? It will have authority sort of borrowed from the main domain, even if there are no links directly to it. So it is possible for a service page on a website with low or no linking root domains to actually rank for that phrase despite the fact that there's, you know, you know, it overcomes that because the domain itself is so credible. In that example, you have to build up the authority of the domain a lot by having lots of content, other content with lots of links to it. There are definitely opportunities, though, to get links directly to the thing that you really want. You know, you're, you're having a conversation with someone, they're a friend, you did a solid for somebody, they're going to help, you know, you built a network of relationships with editors and authors. Uh, people do this for each other. It's it, it's just called, you know, it's really yeah. an outcome of friendship. So I'm going to emphasize networking, relationships, and friendships. <laughs> uh, because that, you know, there are people who, if they if I got a text message from them with, a, with a, a web address, four minutes later, there'll be a link to that address. Because I love that guy. I will help him. He's done so much for me. You know, it's just, we, we're all like that, right? It's reciprocity. Yeah. It's human nature. Yeah, that's, that's great. Now, the next question that I get that's related to that, we talk quite a bit about is people that are saying, well, why do I even have a blog? <laughs> so uh, I'm teeing okay. these up for you, Andy. <laughs> nope, yep. So if you want to rank for the money phrase, so every key phrase, we, I mentioned very briefly intent. Yeah. Uh, separate the navigational queries, like the branded keywords. Every mm -hmm. key phrase has, two, has one of two different kinds of intent, mm -hmm. commercial intent or information intent. In other words, it's either a dollar sign or a question mark. If you want to rank for the dollar sign commercial intent key phrase on your service page, your site has to have sufficient authority. If you want authority, your site has to have links to it. If you want links to your site, you have to have two things, relationships with people who create content because they make links, and something worthy of being linked to. No one's going to link to that service page as we just said. So no content marketing, no link worthy content. No link worthy content, no links. No links, no domain authority, no domain authority, no ranking for the commercial intent key phrase. Yeah. Show me, show me a category where the rank and traffic and you know the the visitors worth a lot of money. Show me a competitive category where the sites that rank have no content. It doesn't exist, right? They all do. It's the the internet's quite mature now, so it's like uh, it's like saying uh, I, I don't I, I want to win the race. I don't need wheels. 
I just need a car that will win the race. No, no, that is the car. That's the point. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. What rank? Yeah, so. Yeah, it's like it, tires it's win races. Weird... <laughs> you know, yeah. like days of thunder days. This one's for you, Harry. Tires win races, you know. Exactly, yeah. 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 It's like, these are the tires. So I yeah. try to connect all those dots, like everything that you need. You want the lead, mm -hmm. you need traffic and conversion rate. You want traffic, you need search rankings. You want search rankings, you need authority. You want authority, you need links. You want links, you need link-worthy content and relationships. Therefore... Mm -hmm. We're publishing yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. I use an expression about all, all roads lead to Rome. Rome was an have. empire not just because it had one good city, because it had, you know, it owned, what, half, mm -hmm. of, half of Europe, but it all <laughs> led back to the critical mm -hmm. pieces, right? And so yeah. that's just... Interconnectedness, it, super yeah. important. Great yeah. metaphor. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about how do you create content? One of the things that you had talked about before is, is like there's no wasted content. What I mean by that is, is that you talk about the depth you go into emails and why. Can you unpack that? Yeah, it's funny. Like if um, So let's say you and I were starting a new company today and we're talking to our first prospect this afternoon and they say, why do I need a blog? And we just explain what we just explained. Mm -hmm. The very next thing that that person's going to say to us he or she will say, but I don't have time to create that content. I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. If you go down that path, okay, I get it. I'm busy too. Tell me about your day. You're going to find out that they're busy doing email. I think the average is like 23% of time professional, you know, people like us spend like a lot of time in the inbox. I don't have time to write because I'm too busy in my email responding to clients and prospects important questions mm -hmm. with detailed emailed answers. Like, that's like saying you don't have time to create content because you're, bu you're too busy creating content. <laughs> it's ironic, isn't it? Yeah. You are doing that exact job. You're, you're talking to the audience. You're talking on relevant topics to them. right? You're investing time in that. Yeah. So when I figured that out, I basically uh, created a little framework for myself where when I get a question via email, I first take a breath because I'm, I shouldn't be irritated. It's actually an opportunity to teach. If it's a question I've answered before, I can just send a link and that's Mm -hmm. a direct traffic visitor and that's always you know that's a good sign that's that means you've been publishing on the right topics but uh so i take a deep breath and i'm going to answer this person's question uh in a detailed way with an image or two if i've got it with bullet lists with like subheads yeah. and i will write 400 word answers in email to prospects and clients like all and but i have a, a place where i save those and then eventually I'll go take all those out of there and I'll put them into uh, like giant Google Docs. The first time I did this, I had like, you know, it was 94 pages of content after three years. I had written, <laughs> basically I've written a book and that's not weird. We're all writing books. Yeah. You could just, we're just not organized. And yeah. all I'm suggesting is that you are more thoughtful and deliberate in how you manage your day-to-day -day communication because all of that stuff that you're typing all the time can be repurposed into articles, articles that you know are on target because you wrote them specifically for a person that, you know, for whom it's relevant. So, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a great content hack, and it also addresses that probably fundamental yeah. objection. I have no time to write yeah. BS. Yeah. I, I started doing that, I, I think I heard you say that almost a year ago, and I started doing mm. I literally have a folder in my email and from yep. time to time, I literally go back and said, and I'm not saying I'm Shakespeare. I'm like, you know what? I needed to win that sale. So I needed to say it right. And if I had to say yep. it right then, why wouldn't it get on my website? That's you right. Know? Yeah. Me too. So I did the same thing. It, but it did frame how I started to answer questions. Meaning mm. if you know it's ultimately going to be on your website, you actually write it in a way that's different than like jargon and like, hey, Bob, you know what I mean? You know, It's just right. very – very different. You know what I mean? And I, I think yeah. that subtle mind shift makes all the difference. Yeah. It's, I mean, just imagine two, two different, two different people starting at the same point today. And one of them decides to be more deliberate, applies some forethought, comes up with a plan to harvest these things, you know, and, and end up turning them into content. Fast forward three years. One of these people has an active blog, you know, owns their list. One of you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're sending articles to the next person who asked that question. Yeah. The other person is still having conversations in private. This is an old saying of social media marketers. Never, have a, uh, never waste a good conversation by having it in private. It's, yeah. a waste of, it's not a waste of time, but it's a missed opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 
Very cool. Very cool. Because what I started to do is that unlocked something in my head that was saying, like, if I'm doing it in email, where else are we doing it? And mm. we started to look back. So we have a wiki. It's an internal wiki. Hmm. And, you know, we're obsessive about standard operating procedures. <laughs> I don't know whether your company's Good like for that you. or not. Um, it's, yeah, we it's document a, a lot it's, of stuff. It's, it's crazy. It's a, right? there's, there's so many details. You've got to. Our yeah, industry has so many details. It's Yeah. I mean, it's funny, too, because... Sometimes I'll say this is a blog and I'll say the price of the blog and they're like, how did it, how did it take so long to do a blog? And I'm like, well, let's just look at writing. Now let's look at research. Now let's look at an editor. And then the editor went back to you and then you had notes sure. and you know what I mean? They don't know what's going on. But from an SOP standpoint, what we started to do is say, hey, if I already have this here, why aren't my SOPs just modified just slightly and turned into a blog? Mm -hmm. Because you always talk about, you know what, there's two different reasons why people um, become an influencer. You know, you either have a very strong opinion or right. you have your own homegrown data. Right. My, my third one that I do is, is that if I can give you zero mental calories and spoon feed you content, right? right, nine times out of 10, you will digest my content just because I've worked so hard to spoon feed it for you. Hmm. You know what I mean? That's it. Yeah, yeah. And so my That's SOPs… Great become spoon feeded content because I had to figure out all of the, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All of the details yeah. first. So people like almost like I've got a problem and I want a cookbook. I'm like, well, we write cookbooks, <laughs> you know, it's crazy, but it's what we do. It is. They're like recipes. I have a, I heard a presentation once by someone who said it was like a game. You know, when he went to a sales meeting, uh, walked into the office and on his way from the front door to the conference room yeah. w would look around and try to find content that could be repurposed and would frequently find content that could be repurposed, like in the lobby, so, wow. you know, like a sc digital screen with a video or there's like a brochure or something. And just yeah. conversation becomes, have you ever published this? Yeah. One of my best examples of that is this, um, uh, we have, I mean, SOP, it's like a checklist, a massive checklist prior to launching websites. Like it's 50 more things. It's a long list. Mm -hmm. So I knew we had this. I, and so I just asked him like, where's the latest website launch checklist? It's probably two days later, it's an article. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, it's ranking high. Website launch checklist. It's got like 70,000 views on it. <laughs> it's like, I don't know where it is today, but it was for a long time, it outranked HubSpot's yep. much shorter list. I don't think yeah. they launch as many sites as we do. And, just, um, and it was just sitting in, it's like sitting in a bin. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it was like, like a those, Google Doc. It's, it's like, like a like spreadsheet. Like, yeah, exactly. Google Sheet. Like you ever see yeah. those like cold cases? When they were like, yeah. oh, yeah, the evidence was in Johnson's yeah, locker. Yeah, it's like a box in the basement. Like, damn, yeah, this thing's going to rank like a champ. i to get this out of here. Yeah, I just I'm found old. A, I remember the Nikki yeah. gun. Do you remember Nikki gun? Yeah, He's I like, do oh, remember. The missing Nikki evidence gun. to the Keller case. My God, he was innocent. <laughs> you know, he was like, I he hit the, he got the chair three years ago, Frank. <laughs> you know? it's, that, yeah. it, it, it's that feeling, right? It's like, oh, I had this this whole time. Like, it was just sitting yeah. on my desk. Like. Just look around you, you know, like yeah. there's, it's a uh, content yep. is everywhere. There's an Anne Hanley quote. She says everything that the light touch, that's a Lion King movie reference. Everything the light touches is content. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, it's just a different mentality. Basically, this is like a mindset thing mm -hmm. we're describing. It's yeah. not weird to us, but yep. uh, there's a lot of people who kind of haven't flipped that switch yet. Mm -hmm. And there's people, hopefully there are people who, who listen or watch this and just go look at their sent mail folder and find articles. Yeah. They go right. look at their best practices, their procedures, their handbooks, and find articles. Yep. Just, you know, some of that stuff is almost ready, ready yeah. to go live. We create these things. We call them asset pages. Uh, frequently asked questions or commonly asked objections. Mm -hmm. We put them in 90-second video clips. Cool. And then literally the page just eventually becomes a, a video version of frequently asked questions. Mm -hmm. They outrank almost every piece of content on the web. Hmm. Only from the aspect of you know what, like some people wanted to read it, some people wanted to enjoy it in video, but I came to your website because I had a problem. And, you know, we, we deal a lot with healthcare. So like, hey, you know what, like I've got this shoulder ache that's going on and I'll just get surgeons and they'll just say, you know, if it's clicking, it's a problem. If it's, you know, and all, and ah. as that library grows, it's just, it's, it's amazing because I, all I just ask is something that is not rocket science. I'm like, what are the questions you hear most? Mm -hmm. I'm like, don't keep that in your office. Let's tell the world that, you know? I think part of the mental shift that, that um, isn't discussed that much and that, you know, what you and I are suggesting here and embracing is that 
the idea is that content is, is durable. Mm -hmm. We do these things because we know that if we invest a little more time in it, that we'll have an asset that will last. Mm -hmm. I think there's traditional marketers who kind of think like, you know, this is an article is like a press release, like it has a very short lifespan. Or they have like an advertising campaign mentality where this thing's only going to be live for a little while. No. These are things where you can publish it today, get traction, get feedback, improve it next year, keep getting traction, keep getting feedback, ranks low, ranks, you know, on page two this week, keep improving it, keep adding to it, you know, next time you answer a related question, you know, go back and put that back, put that into the article. These things sort of grow like assets. It's like an investing mentality. Yeah. Uh, because uh, content, there's, there's, you know, advertising, what do we say? Advertising is temporary, but content is forever. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I do think is interesting, though, about, so I got two different thoughts. One, I mean, that's why when you write a book like this, it might take another year to keep adding to it. But if mm -hmm. all of this is in blog format, like you just said, you can just jump right back in and add a new thought just like that. We live in a golden age of being able to update content. I mean, think yeah. about 20 years ago, your, your life and your approach is totally different. And the, the opportunities for authors is huge. Uh, were you and I talking about James Clear, mm. Atomic Habits? Yeah. I just had a conversation we, we, with someone about the Atomic no, Habits guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you and I talked about that. Yep. The, the first edition of that book, mm -hmm. he's talking about what his readers said and the feedback he got on something. That was the first edition. He's clearly leveraging blog articles <laughs> that he's yeah. gotten that, yeah. that have been vetted with his mm -hmm. audience, you know, so it's uh, it's you know, the internet is a dialogue. When you put something up there, you get feedback on it. I don't panic. Another weird thing, this might surprise people, but uh, I've gone back and looked at articles that have been live for months and be like, oh, damn it, there was a typo in this. But who cares? It's just a blog post. And if it's yeah. a big problem, your audience will tell you, hey, you yeah. missed a sentence. Like, you know, that should have said this or, you know, there's a, you misspelled that or something like very forgiving, you know, and here's another uh, quote. This was not from me. I don't know who said this first, but uh, digital ink is never dry. There's no such thing as a finished yeah. article or a finished website or a finished web page. It, it's, uh, it's never over. You can keep fighting, keep improving, keep making it better, keep trying to win that little contest. You know what is interesting, though, is, is the opposite is also true. What I mean by that is, is that I, I was reading this blog, and do you know how long David Ogilvy's advertising ads ran? Mm -mm. On average, 12 years. Wow. 12 years. Now, the idea of that is once you find that unicorn, mm -hmm. promote the hell out of that unicorn. Yeah. Because what the opposite problem that you can have is, is that you churn so many ideas and you promote none of them. And this is one of the, the gripes I have with HubSpot. It was like, don't just publish and pray because, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? You're going to be a needle in a stack of needles in no time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I think one of the things that's interesting about the way you describe, I use the word content clusters, but you were talking about ecosystem, mm -hmm. is you are writing just as much content outside of your website than you're writing on your website. If, if, yeah. yeah. I do. I write for other people. I still mm -hmm. do that. Uh, I would probably never stop doing that. You know, guest posting here and there, helping mm -hmm. people out or trying to reach a different audience. Uh, it all matters. It all makes a difference. Uh, this was, uh, so you and I both know Brian Dean or, um, yeah. uh, he, the, there was like a little throwaway blurb at the bottom of an interview somewhere, um, where he sort of said like, it was the idea about updating content. Like it's, he sort of said like, only if everything is ranking where I think it should be, will I write something new? If not, I'll go back and rewrite something old. That is not a common perspective. A lot of people think that their publishing calendar demands that they come out with something completely new, like every Friday or something. I've only, so 500 articles I mentioned, I've, my, my frequency has never been more than, than every other week. Mm -hmm. People wow. often say, I love your weekly blog. I've never written a weekly blog. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, also 25% of my articles at this point are rewrites of mm -hmm. older articles without changing the URL so it's sort of like, um, you know, you don't need to, you'd rather have that cluster, the content hub, the whatever mm -hmm. pillar or cornerstone, whatever. Yeah, you're far better off making really strong interconnected stuff that goes deep on the topics that you're both expert at and your audience really cares about and promoting the heck out of those by, you know, keeping them in social rotation, you know, putting them, you know, back in a newsletter because they're live again. 
Uh, that is a way, way better approach than flood the zone, post and pray, I've got a thousand things of medium quality. Just look at the analytics. There's five pages on your site that bring more than half the traffic, almost always. So you really, you're, you know, what you're hoping for, if, you're, if you have a search perspective, of course, is to just create more of those outliers. One or two more of those big performers will give you better results than 50 medium performers. Because every chart in digital marketing is a log scale, you know, um, algorithmic curve. Yeah. Now, do you ever build utilities? I am. Um, the tools? Yeah. So I was finding that some of the, the, the most visits I get to my website are the tools I've built. So it's like this very weird thing, but um, if you were to look at your mobile phone, uh, mm -hmm. are you an Android or an iPhone guy? Android. Android. If you go to YouTube and you try to send me a YouTube video, it's maybe they've changed it on, on, on Android. But if you said, Hey, I want you to start it at second, mm -hmm. one minute and 33 seconds mm -hmm. on the browser, there's a timestamp that says you can share this and it starts at a minute, one, one minute and 33 yep. seconds. Yep. They haven't done that on the mobile phone on Apple. And I don't believe on Android yet either. Really? Hmm. Yeah. And so what I did was I got so tired of that is I just created a page on my website mm -hmm. where my, programmer just says copy the link and the, and the minute mark and it generates out the shareable link good for you that's Six, cool Sixteen thousand visits a month <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> uh, has it attracted yeah. links yeah you know that's that's the that's it has attracted links yes has it okay. um what do you call it has it generated any direct correlation to to us developing video content or anything youtube related not really but i'm i'm literally using it like you just said as a hook for links. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, we made one. So, uh, I think I was at MozCon and someone made a presentation and they said like, what detracts the most links? It might've been Ross, Ross Simmons. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like the number one thing, the number two, so I've often said original research is the ultimate format for attracting links because you support other people's stuff. You're adding evidence to, you know, contribute yep. to the conversation and, you know, they're writing something and you're giving them, you know, adding credibility to things that other people create. Actually, Ross found that that was number two. Original research was not number one. It was utilities and tools. Mm. So probably the best example for us was we built a URL builder, okay. which, of, of which there are dozens. Yeah. Um, but ours ranks for URL builder um, somewhere on page one. And it's got maybe, um, I don't know, 20,000 page views a year or something. It's been linked to a couple dozen times. Uh, it's doing its job of being, you know, Again, contest of generosity. Let's be yeah. as helpful as possible. Yeah. It, it, um, so yeah, it's, it's a different game, right? It takes a programming budget. It's a little more of an act of faith. Mm -hmm. um, but when you talk about utility, yeah, it's literally a utility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, did you ever read the book Disrupted by Dan Lyons? Mm -mm. He was an insider guy at HubSpot, worked for HubSpot. And then, oh, I wanted to read that. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny. So there's a there's a show on HBO called Silicon Valley. I love that show. <laughs> he became a writer for them. Oh and, really? Oh yeah. There's a lot of HubSpot isms and Salesforce isms. That's like the, funny. Huh. I don't really know that or not, but the the guy I'm trying to think of the guy's name, the guy who runs Hooli. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't the know. The main guy. Name. He's one of the, yeah, the main. Yeah, right. The main yep. ne nemesis is um. Mm -hmm. He's the the CEO of uh, Salesforce. <laughs> really? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, well, Dan Lyon was talking about in HubSpot that they have just floors and floors and floors of salespeople. Right. But the number one source of leads is their marketing grader utility. Still. Yep. That Still. was the first thing. That was the first time I ever heard of HubSpot. Yeah. Like, oh, put in your yep. URL. Like, oh, it gave you this little thing. Like, I yeah. know. Very interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. So, you know, I think the power of utility, but like you said, if you can solve a problem, right? I was finding that the ubiquitousness of that YouTube thing was getting me links, even if it was non-niche. Because I, yeah. I, I happen to believe that I, there's a guy named Chad DeBolt from Searchability, and he talks about, uh, he puts a quadrant of links, and he'll talk about mm. in quadrant four is like a link that's low value, link maybe quadrant three is might be, you know, a link that's has more value but not in niche and and in what you're really looking for is the highest authority and the highest niche. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Like if I got, 
if I got a backlink from Rachel Ray, it'd be very different than if I got a backlink from Moz. You, you know what I mean? I suspect that's true. This is one of those SEO things, though, that's that we're, for which there's really no evidence or way to study that. Okay. Yeah. Right? I mean, we all believe that to be true. I personally believe mm -hmm. that to be mm -hmm. true or very likely. But uh, I've never seen uh, – there's, there's no way for anyone to actually research or quantify that or mm. – it just makes sense. I hope it's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it's true. But, <laughs> but uh, that's one of those where, um, you know, it's like, is it like superstition or it's like just – is it yeah. just common, common, common yeah. sense or – Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, it should be. I mean, links from, mm -hmm. from relevant sites – uh, strangely though, if you run tools to see like, you know, who are your, who are your competitors, mm -hmm. like SEMrush or Moss, Moss is a new tool now for this. I think it's in beta. Like who are your competitors? It, it, those don't even look like my competitors. Yeah. Those are just like crazy egg. Yeah. Oh, you know, they think I'm, that I'm a competitor to crazy egg because I blog on similar topics to them. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, right? Content competition has very little relation sometimes to like business, mm -hmm. you know, Qualified leads, you know, um, service offerings, value proposition, and uh, you know the, the the competition for our services is very different from the competition for our keyword for those uh, for blog posts, uh, information, intent queries. Yeah, because I I ran into a, a situation where I had a client and he comes to me and he's like, you know what? I read a blog that all of the traffic comes from the first three results on the first page of Google, and mm. I want to be found on the first page of Google for this keyword. And he was so incredibly insistent on it and i'm like actually your page your your result number six he's like that's not good enough and i was like let me tell you why it is because the first five companies are all software companies and you're a service company and so if you start to look at intent mm -hmm. intent they're not trying to do it themselves they're looking for someone to solve your problem so you are the friend right. you are number one on page one to solve his problem not do it in, you know what i mean yep and I do know what you mean. And, and in that example, it's very helpful for the title tag, assuming Google doesn't rewrite it, to mm -hmm. indicate to the to the searcher that that page is going to satisfy for the other intent. Yeah, uh, I've seen this before. It's like, um, you know, there's if you're talking about real estate, you know, Redfin and Realtor.com, they're not, they don't have an agent for you. But there's tons of other examples like this. Uh, we did one for a chemical company. Um, they're not a client, but. If you, these chemical names, you know, they sell bulk chemicals. All the high-ranking pages are just general information. It's like Wikipedia-type pages. Mm -hmm. They're the only one on page one that actually has this thing for sale. But you can't tell that at a distance, right? But they needed to update their title text to say, buy yeah. hexavalent chromium, blah, blah, blah. Like, just so that the scanner knows, right, that not all of these pages are going to satisfy their intent. They know Wikipedia is not going to sell them anything. You know, they're, 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 they're scanning past that. Uh, so yeah, I'm never surprised to see, and Google Search Console will show you, relatively high click-through rates for relatively low positions. Not weird at all. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it's it really comes down to to intent. Now, mm -hmm. when you get if you were to tell me first intent on page two, I'd say that 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 it falls off a cliff after that. You still <laughs> got to be. Right. <laughs> it's the, yeah, you still have to be visible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, that it's is like, true. You know. I'm, you should, I'm sure you've heard this a billion times. It's like, where do you hide a dead body? It's like mm -hmm. on page two of Google, you know? Yep. I find that all the metrics are like, I don't even tell my account managers. Like if it's on page two, don't even tell the client until it's on page one. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to start to look about intent, click-through rate and all that stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I've, I've got lots of examples. I, I used to rank number one for like 10 years, Chicago web design. And like algorithm change or some change. And I moved from like p position one to position four mm -hmm. for several months. No change in traffic. Wow. I think the intent of the person who searches for Chicago web design, they're going to be considering multiple options. It's a consultative thing. It's not, you're not adding that to cart. Yeah. So the visitor, the, the searcher for that phrase was going to all these different sites. Mm -hmm. It was, it, so weirdly, that change in ranking never actually affected my traffic. Now we're back. We're like number two or something. Yeah. But um, it's a... Uh, uh, Ranking fluctuations for my homepage for our most valuable phrases have surprisingly low impact on actual traffic or qualified, um, you know, marketing qualified leads. It's funny because once I get to a spot where I find that a certain keyword or two, I am really glad that I'm ranking for it in that spot, but my competition is there, 
I start to write, I know it sounds weird, I go in and I modify the content to write in the negative. And what I mean by that is mm. I do this thing where I'm like, I know that you just said web development experience is going to cost maybe a hundred to $200,000, so maybe less, but maybe more, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? They're not just going to pick the first. They're not picking the first car on no. the first dealership, right? Right. So then, what I start doing is I start to say, "Ask, ask the other providers that you're looking at if they do this, 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 or right. this." So, I was telling you before the break, we do this thing. It's called a gap assessment. Thick book. That looks awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. got to be an incredible tool. Yeah. Three. It, it takes us about ten weeks. I've got eight people. When we start a new client, literally, we they dive on it like like building an ant farm. You know what I mean? Mm. It's just like, like, but, <laughs> but what's crazy about it, it's like crazy, but is that this is my three to five year roadmap. It's based upon data. We're trying to make data driven decisions, not hunches mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. like that. And then like what I do is when I'm ranking for that keyword, I'm like, ask Joe Blow, web designer for this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or are you literally counting on the hunches of the smartest guy in the company? Because... And you can know this for sure. Is that like the smartest guy in the company is not going to give you all of his time. You're going to get a fraction of it. And so everything else is related down to, I hope he trained his people yeah. to do really well too, because I think that so many companies fall in love with the rock star in the company and he doesn't work for you. Yeah, I don't I, work I'd for my clients. It's, it's weird, but I don't work for my clients on a daily basis. So you have it, to say, you know what? Trust my system. Don't trust me. Right. Yeah. And and the educated buyer um, knows that. I sort of love this conversation because we we just went from it's not just about the key phrase. It's also about the click through rate and the traffic. And then you went straight past that to the even more important message, which is it's not just about having traffic. It's about differentiating yourself to this visitor after they land on your page. Yeah. So this is it's the junior SEO who is just obsessed with positions, rankings, with specific keywords, right? Yeah. By the way, any page that ranks, ranks for like dozens or hundreds or thousands of phrases. I'm not sure if people really realize that. That's why we no longer target the key phrase. We target the topic. Mm -hmm. you know, I, try, I, go, I broadly spread out my meaning across all the subtopics. So yeah, it's the, the more junior the, per, the SEO or the client or, the, or the, the person you're talking to, the more obsessed they are with one position for one key phrase. Yeah. It's not about the, the rank for the specific phrase. It's yeah. about the visibility of the URL. And it's mm -hmm. not about just that. It's about traffic to the URL. And it's not just about that. It's about the bounce rate, time on page, click through rate, conversion rate for that visit. Now you're actually creating demand. So it's a yeah. problem I have with SEOs in general. It's like they're just blinders. It's so narrow thinking. Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, and let me rant for just one more second. I know this like EAT, right? Mm -hmm. Expertise, authority, and trust. Yeah. This is like a, it was like a press release from Google that like the whole SEO world flipped upside down. Like, oh, we got to add a trust to our pages. Now you care about trust? <laughs> that, as soon as you think it's a, a, a search ranking factor, you suddenly want to make your pages trustworthy and add expertise and add authority. You're, it's hilarious. Like, yeah. you should have been doing this the whole time. Yeah. SEOs are like, it, it, it's like a, what you want to be is a dual threat marketer that pays attention to both the traffic and the conversion rate, both the cheese and the mousetrap. <laughs> SEOs don't care about anything until they think that, until they have some suspicion or there was a tweet from John Mueller or whatever that says that that's now a search ranking factor. Ridiculous. I'm sorry. I'm calling, I'm calling it right today. That is ridiculous that SEOs suddenly care about trust. Didn't you have visitors prior to this day when the Google's <laughs> press release came out? Didn't you want trust before then? Did you fail to add evidence and data and support and, you know, points of view and experts into your content before that day? Yeah. Oh no, now it's time to add trust. This is 2021. <laughs> How long have you had a website? <laughs> well, you, 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 did you care about, what do you think the visitor? Yeah. It, it's insane. It's a, <laughs> it's a really small minded community. I'm sorry to say it's, it, yeah. um, I mean, that those are hard. I, I should pull back a little from that, but you know what I mean? When I, we put a lot of money into our office to kind of create this show and you walk in and I, even though we're outside of Philly, we wanted it to feel like Manhattan. And we did this Disney experience, like literally like this Ritz Carlton Disney experience thing where how we greet people at the door when they come to the elevator and they walk in and the cups they drink out of the whole thing is just a dance when you get into our office. And then I literally try to do things like this. People are like, well, we need to be 
on the first page of Google, and I'm just like, why? Yeah, walk me through your thinking. Well, just why? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when they get there? And I'm looking at your website, like, so cool. I have mm -hmm. no idea what you do. <laughs> yeah. It looks cool, right? So my point is, I'm like, if I could just wave a magic wand and get you on the first page of Google, yep. amazing. But you know what? Now what? It's a very valuable thought experiment. Just ask them, mm -hmm. what if what you wanted was true today? How much better do you think your life would be? Yeah. Is that some, is that, how magical would that be to rank for that phrase? Yeah. What do you think would happen? Go, uh, so let's say the current page ranked for that phrase. What's, mm -hmm. the, what's the bounce rate? You know, what's the click through rate? How effective is the call to action on that page? Yeah. What percentage of visitors who land on your contact page actually make it to the thank you page? <laughs> oh, it's 6%. Oops. Yeah, you probably do need a lot of traffic. Go buy some ads. Yeah. You got a very leaky bucket and you're asking for water. Like, yes. slow down. Like, what, That's awesome. what are we doing here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, People. and then the other thing is the inverse happening. So I'm, um, I'm writing an article for, um, for, uh, feels like I'm flexing here, writing an article for Forbes right now. But mm -hmm. it's literally the idea that we're building our house on sand. Hmm. You know what I mean? I think you and I were talking about this before. And because, I mean, I, I, I think, Andy, I, the, the bad news, the tough news is that you and I are old men in this industry. So like mm -hmm. 20 years. I know. I, I've just seen so much stuff. And so I, I was there the day I woke up and the Google algorithms changed and all my results plummeted because I didn't know. Or I, I should have been smarter to know that, you know what, links from China shouldn't happen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> remember mm -hmm. that day very vividly. And I remember the day when Facebook's organic reach plummeted to 2%. Yep. And you think, oh, those days are gone. And then Apple, <laughs> which is so funny, basically comes out with a privacy update. Now, I applaud the privacy part, but I do think it's ironic that people buy a phone and they wait around the block for that phone because it's the most intuitive piece of hardware you can own. And then <laughs> basically when we take the privacy, we're saying we're going to keep it, everything. We're going to protect your privacy, but you know what? Right. Now when you look for a washing machine, you're going to see ads for lawnmowers. <laughs> you know, because the, yeah. you, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that device is now a little bit more like a brick. Like you don't know it, but that, that tool got dumber. Mm -hmm. In the sake of privacy. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm, I'm not. I don't have a horse in the race. But no, you didn't. Yeah. You know what I mean. But yep. they're not. What they're not saying is the price that you're going to pay for not being tracked. Because I do believe, in some form, that marketers help us speed up our choices. It, that's a matter of efficiency, right? It's a uh, mm -hmm. targeting is more efficient. It leads to less waste. You know. I haven't seen a dog food ad in years, but prior to you know more intelligent targeting, I saw tons of dog food ads. Waste of money. I don't have a dog food. I don't have a dog, oh, right? Why have to yeah. try some? So, yeah, there's um, that that's a factor. The, the so you're going to own less of your data. Uh, you already don't own your search rankings or your social followers. Uh, you own so really like what are we building here? I called it an investment earlier, right? What are we building? Where, um, what do we own? You own, technically no, actually, but you, functionally, you own your domain name. Mm -hmm. You own your, uh, your website interface design. You actually don't technically own your CMS, but whatever. You own your content. You own your email list. You own your brand. These are the things that you have control over that, the, uh, that, that can't be taken away from you. You know, there's no governing body, you know, that can restrict you. Big tech is a problem. These monopolies don't have the, the business owner's interest in mind. Uh, ultimately, they don't, right? They, they're a, an advertising duopoly. Um, their profits are, in, are off the charts right now. It is breathtaking how much money these companies are making. Like mm -hmm. Google's net, um, I think net profit is up like 160% over last year at this time. It's crazy. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. So, yeah, it's... Um, uh, you just do it with that, with, uh, with that, with clear understanding, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you need access to an audience and you can, uh, you can buy that audience. You can borrow that audience. You can, um, but I think one of the better ways to do it is, um, rather than paying a, a you know, big tech is to do exactly what you and I are doing today, which is just to collaborate with other people, make something together, 
get to build your network, right? Be creative. Yeah. Be helpful. And then, you know, no one can take away the fact that you are top of mind for a topic or for a service. That's called a brand. That's where your long-term security will come from. Uh, so strengthen those really high-touch relationships and be to be in, you know, the world like we live in, you know, um, you know, high value, low volume, B2B service companies like ours. Uh, but yeah, it's a, you can grumble if your search rankings drop or if your social reach gets throttled, gets throttled back, but don't be surprised. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you did, you, that was never yours. It was never yours, you know, and I, that's, that's sort of where I'm at too, is, is that, you know, I, in the, the summary of the article, I'm just like, one, you got to diversify. If you put all your eggs in one basket and say, it's gotta be SEO. You could wake up one day and the algorithm changes and your SEO is gone. I could say mm -hmm. paid ads, literally remarketing on mobile phones will be like, we, you're very, you're, we're very, we're on the precipice of a cookieless future. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. I think they'll change the game. I don't think that these marketers are out to less know about, to know less about their clients, mm -hmm. but I, you know what I mean? But like you said, the, the final thing is, is the power of your brand. That's you right. You know what I mean? Um, and so. Do something memorable. Do something yeah. unexpectedly helpful, yep. disarmingly direct. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, make a difference in someone's life. You know, make give someone a good feeling. Help someone. Help other people with introductions or with, with an article. Make a video that 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 you know people really need. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, that will never. Nothing about that will ever change. Right? Mm -hmm. What I just described will always work. You know, will always be valuable. Yeah. Yeah. One last thing. I wanted to give you time because I'm just looking at the clock. I wanted to give you time. Uh, you Every single year, you do a phenomenal job on your annual blogger survey. And like this, the data that comes from that, if you, if you haven't seen what Andy and his team build, it's a must. You absolutely have to do this. And if you're, even if you're a buyer and working with an agency, it would be wonderful for you to know how the cake is made. <laughs> Because the mm -hmm. ingredient, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that sometimes they just expect you to just, you know what I mean? They have no yeah. idea that you have literally sourced this stuff from the farthest regions of the world. You know what I mean? If I'm still using that cake analogy. Yep. So, what I, if you, are you able to share your screen? Because I would like to just kind of do sure. this. And while you're doing that, if you are a blogger or there's bloggers on your team, Andy's got a survey that he's going to ask you to fill out or request that you fill out. Because he's looking for a thousand bloggers to contribute to this every single year, and I know it sounds weird, but a thousand is so many people. It's like, it's like hurting it's cats. <laughs> you know it I mean? takes me a ton of manual outreach. I need yeah. I call in favors from famous friends. But yeah, this this one piece of content, uh, this URL, answers some really important questions for the industry that actually supports lots of our messages. The average blog post takes almost four hours to write which is 40% longer than it took eight years ago or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So year after year, we publish this piece that benchmarks performance and shows what actions correlate with stronger or weaker performance, the length of an average blog post, what, the, what content tends to include. You know, there's, there's input from some of my, you know, Chris, you and I, you know, heroes mm -hmm. in both of our worlds. So, yeah. Yeah, this is a v important piece of content on the internet, and I would be thrilled, so grateful if you could take it or just send it to someone that you know. It's it's like twelve. It's a it's a three minute thing. It's a very short survey, and uh, the data is useful to so many of us. So, thanks for the chance to plug that. It makes a big difference. Uh, yeah, very grateful um, yeah. that we were able to mention that. Bloggers fill it out, but everybody else like just read it. It's, I, I I love this stuff because that, that's. The one thing you'll get from Andy every single time, and I think we already brought this, is he's going to bring the data and he's going to bring it in written form and in illustrated form. And, you know, I mean, I've got so much data that people just don't read. And I'm, I might even be one of those guys, but I will I will look at a picture and dissect a picture. You know what I mean? And, and it's like, it's amazing mm -hmm. how data, if, if, if communicated effectively, it just, it turns... You know, it turns the wheel in your head just very differently sometimes than just words on the page. So without it, we're just a bunch of unsupported claims. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, uh, this is like the fastest two hours of my life. So this I has know, been awesome. So quick. <laughs> but um, 
if if people wanted to come out and they wanted to hear about you do a lot of public speaking. Are you still doing any public speaking now that in this oh, Delta like COVID era? Oh, it's like a week. It's like stuff like this yeah. um, a couple times a week. Uh, okay. Much, very little in person, um, which is fine. Yeah. Yeah. But when this country turns but comes whole mm-hmm. again, Andy's how, – how often were you on the road before this madness? Oh, if you count webinars and classes, I teach a few classes a year. I was given like 100 presentations a year. Yeah. Um, two a week on average for sure. But Sometimes travel? a couple a day. Heavy travel too? Uh, not only a few times since COVID started, but uh, yeah, I was, you know, twice a month headed to a conference here or there. Gosh, yeah. Yeah. God bless but, your wife. No, you can find uh, me yeah. anywhere. I mean, even yeah. without that, LinkedIn is a great yeah. place to connect with me. Um, orbitmedia.com is where I publish every other week. As I mentioned, that's the biweekly newsletter. Uh, and then just conversations like this, man, this was awesome. Yeah, this is very cool. Very cool. Um, Andy, super fan. Um, I'm a super fan of what you're doing and I would love to do this again. You know, this was, this is really great. So to my listeners, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us on digital marketing masterclass. It's my commitment to speak with uh, legends in this field, people that are literally innovators and the people that are changing the game, communicating with data, and really, really, really shaping the way we think about our products, our services, and our businesses. So thank you once again. Please remember to subscribe, and we'll tune in, uh, I believe, in about two weeks. Thanks again. Thank you for watching this video. What I wanted to do now is share something with you that we believe is very special. What we wanted to share is something we call the Ferritic Unique Process. What you'll see on this page is this is our entire roadmap that we've built over the last 21 years. We implement this process for all of our inbound marketing clients, and we believe that if you implement some of these strategies into your own marketing, you're gonna have tremendous results. We've developed this page to be not only in video format, but also text and chapter format as well. When done effectively, this process is gonna help your organization build marketing systems that generate leads, nurture leads into clients, and then convert those clients into raving fans of your product, service, mission, and vision. If you have any questions or concerns about anything that you've read, or you would like to kind of walk through this with one of our specialists, please reach out to us. You can do that at info at So once again, the domain to find out our unique process is ferritechuniqueprocess.com.